boys. Good afternoon, everyone. The subcommittee will come to order. And I'm going to apologize in advance for the length of my remarks, but I think they're important, so let's, let's begin. Uh, first, again, thanks for everybody being here and everybody participating in the hearing uh, of the Subcommittee on Economic Opportunity, where we'll continue the oversight, the implementation of the post-9-11 GI Bill of 2017 and associated payment processing delays. As I said in the two previous hearings this subcommittee has held on this topic, it is critical that we work to ensure that this bill is implemented so that veterans receive their due benefits they deserve in a timely and consistent manner. After all, if all we do is pass reform bills, they're just kind of a memo to the file unless the VA actually implements them effectively. Wouldn't you agree? So. Uh, our hearing uh, that we had on July, uh, sometime in July, we implored the VA officials who were here to remedy whatever problems existed, and we were promised that they would be addressed in a matter of weeks, days, if not weeks. Um, we were also assured that delays would be short and would not significantly impact students. However, as we sit here almost four months later, it's clear that the VA missed on those predictions as well and uh, the student veterans now are finding themselves in a pretty bad uh, situation and we're hearing from them. Uh, and this may be the worst uh, in terms of implementation and, and problems and burdens placed on our student veterans since the uh, 2010 GI Bill changes. Due to increased workload and continued IT failures, a large number of student veterans have uh, contacted uh, members of Congress and VSOs with complaints of extended delays in receiving monthly housing allowance payments. And while VA, uh, the VA has made some attempt at helping these students, and we recognize and appreciate that, I'm still concerned that the VA's uh, have put out confusing public messages and IT deficiencies will continue to put veterans at risk. These veterans, as you know, are relying on these payments to pay rent and put food on the table. This is no small thing. They should no doubt get answers to why these delays are occurring and what is the VA doing to address the situation. One of the main reasons for these persistent setbacks is the continued delay in making modifications to the long-term solution, or LTS, the IT system, to properly implement Section 107 of the law. This section changed the way the VA calculated living stipend payments for students from being based on where a school was headquarters to being based on where the student was taking the majority of their classes. At the subcommittee hearing in July, we were told that the modifications would be um, completed by mid-August. Once, once this date was missed, the VA has never given the committee another estimated date of completion. Unfortunately, we're uh, about to hear from Dr. Lawrence the modifications to the IT system are still not ready, and VA still does not know when they will be ready to deploy the proper payments to GI Bill recipients. I find these delays are simply unacceptable. I'm sure my colleagues uh, feel the same way, and I'm very interested to hear from the VA OINT staff and representatives from Bruce Allen. That'd be the Office of Information Technology and Booz Allen Hamilton, who's the contractor over this project. While I'm certainly not an IT expert, I cannot understand why 15 months after this law was passed, we are sitting here asking these questions. I'm also concerned that when these modifications are finally ready for deployment, the VA's current IT system will not be able to handle the workload. This concern was crystallized by an oversight visit that uh, John and some of the other committee staff members took to Muskegee, Oklahoma, uh, where they have a regional, you guys have a regional processing center. On the visit, staff found dedicated employees uh, trapped in a system with aging IT infrastructure that crashed so often that simple tasks that should have taken five minutes were taking 45 minutes. Staff also learned that between April and, and September, VA managers in Mus Muskegee uh, had to write off 16,890 man hours due to system crashes or latency issues. 
Committee staff said that uh, they witnessed the system while they were there crash no fewer than five times in 10 minutes during a demo. Uh, while VA, OI, and T staff continue to look for ways to address these issues, we've learned that senior VA leaders sent a team of their best quote unquote programmers only after the committee staff's visit. It shouldn't take a congressional oversight visit uh, for uh, the VA to address these issues raised a number of times over the last 15 months. It's also clear that updating and modernizing the half a dozen systems needed to complete a GI Bill claim has not been a priority for the department. As a result, student veterans are now paying the price for VA ignoring and putting Band-Aids on this problem, uh, we believe, for years. I can only begin to imagine the mess VA will have on its hand when these already taxed systems will be used to process the hundreds of thousands of claims that will have to be reworked when the modifications to LTS are ready. What is even worse is the VA will be doing this rework during the same time they typically begin processing claims for the spring semester. This means that while the current inventory of GI Bill claims has been worked down, I'm very worried that schools and students uh, have not seen the worst of payment delays. As I've repeatedly said, uh, many, t many of the hearings and many of the issues covered, not only in the subcommittee, but at the, uh, uh, under the leadership of Chairman Rowe, it seems like, Mr. Chairman, the root cause has, has been IT infrastructure and getting the right IT solutions and managing the IT systems effectively. We saw this earlier in the year with the VOC Rehab Case Management Tool in this committee, another Booz Allen Hamilton project where the department wasted $12 million on an IT system with nothing to show for it. And now we're seeing these problems rise again with the GI Bill. With delays for some veterans stretching over 60 days, some of these guys are gonna have some real hardships, real hard, maybe even personal family crises as a result of this. Uh, I understand the systems are old and complex. It is well past the point where Congress, taxpayers, and most importantly, our student veterans are going to accept the, the same tired excuses. Congress consistently has provided the VA with record budgets. That's, that's clear. Um, and I uh, think the vague answers we've gotten, and uh, we've sent a lot of letters, we've had inquiries, we've had personal meetings. Um, I, I think that the, the, the answers we're getting and the delays and the promises that we'll have it fixed uh, that end up uh, uh, not happening are unacceptable. Again, I think I can speak for the committee to say that, and we're all concerned about our veterans. Dr. Lawrence and Mr. James, I hope you can shed some light on what you and, the Se and Secretary Wilkie are planning to do to address these problems. I hope you can tell us when the LTS modifications will be ready, uh, give students, veterans, simple answers as to why we are in this mess in the first place and what you're gonna do to get it right. Student veterans have completed their mission for all of us, um, and it is time that the VA stand up and hold someone accountable for their failing uh, actions, or the lack of actions, maybe the lack of accountability. I now yield to my friend and ranking member and fellow Texan, Mr. O'Rourke, for any remarks you might have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I don't know that there's a whole bunch that I can add to your excellent opening comments, um, but to say that, that I think typically the format for a hearing like this one, uh, having now served on this committee for six years, is for those of us up here to express our outrage, those of you at the witness table to tell us that you're working on the issue, to express your dedication and commitment to serving veterans, and for all of us to leave with some kind of vague understanding of what will be delivered. What I would challenge all of us to do, since we have um, the VA here, the, the undersecretary responsible, the oversight committee, an authorizing committee, the contractor who's doing the work, is, is to come up with specific deliverables so that every person in attendance and watching and the press who are writing about this leave with a very crystal clear understanding of when this will be fixed, how it will be fixed, and the mechanisms by which we can hold one another accountable. I'll just add that in the reporting that I read in the Washington Post, the spokesman for um, the VA, uh, Mr. Cashauer, blames the VA committee, says that uh, we have not funded the VA's IT needs. If that's the case, um, I'm happy and, and hopefully uh, can work with the chairman and the chairman of the full committee 
to introduce something um, on an uh, emergency basis to get the funding necessary, but my understanding is that we had authorized and appropriated what the VA had asked for so far. If there's more that we can do on our side, in other words, I'm all in, and I want to know exactly what that is right now. Um, I have weeks left in, in my term and my service on this committee. I want to make the most of them. Um, and I think I speak for, for everyone in saying that we're all frustrated and, and want to see something happen. Let's use this meeting today to make that happen. So um, to, to whatever degree you, you can strip down your testimony to, to the when, the how, and the what, and make sure that we have uh, precise deliverables, uh, the more grateful I will be and, and the better chances that we'll be able to deliver something to the veterans who are, who are waiting on us right now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the ranking member. I now invite our first and only panel to the table. Uh, but before I make those introductions, I ask unanimous consent that our colleague, Mr. Kaufman, and our colleague, Mr. Bergman, be allowed to sit at the dais and ask questions during today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. And also want to, again, extend a special thanks to our chairman for being here and being engaged in this as well. Um, with us today, we welcome the Honorable Dr. Paul Lawrence, the Undersecretary of Benefits. Dr. Lawrence is accompanied by uh, General Robert Worley, Director of VA's Education Service. Mr. Bill James, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Development and Operations at the VA Office of Information and Technology. And Mr. John J. Jack Gavin, Associate Deputy Assistant Secretary for Information Technology, Operations and Services at the VA Office of Information and Technology. We also welcome Mr. Richard Crow, Senior Vice President at Booz Allen Hamilton. Uh, let's, uh, thanks again for being here, uh, folks. If you could uh, please stand. I'd like to begin by um, swearing you guys in here or asking that you uh, uh, take an oath uh, to solemnly swear under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to provide is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And uh, if you would reply, I do. Uh, thank you. Please be seated. Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Dr. Lawrence, thank you again for being here. You are now recognized for five minutes. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Arrington, Ranking Member O'Rourke, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting us here today to discuss the implementation of the Forever GI Bill. The Forever GI Bill requires we develop new software which changes the way the monthly housing allowance is paid. The development and the deployment of the new software has not gone as planned. We did not meet the August 1st deadline, and we are continuing to work on getting this right. But let me explain this uh, delay briefly. Historically, we've used the school's facility code to identify the location. Our software linked the student to the main campus of the school and used the facility code to identify the amount to be paid. The new legislation recognizes that a student could earn multiple credits at different locations. In addition to locations such as branch campuses, this could include internships, externships, and practicums, none of which have facility codes. Zip codes of all locations where students earn credits were selected as the new way to identify these new locations. In addition, the possibility that the student would be in multiple locations required the computation of where he or she earned most of the credits and pay the allowance based on that location. The replacement of the facility codes with zip codes and the introduction of new computations for the allowance brought increased complexity. In addition, zip codes were, coded into the, were to be coded into multiple existing systems, which made the situation far more complicated than originally estimated. We are planning for the possibility that we may not have the new software ready for the spring semester. Should that happen, we will be prepared to process claims, as we have been doing, to ensure students will continue to receive their allowances and schools will receive their tuition payments. We would continue to do that for as long as necessary. Before I conclude, I'd like to make three brief additional points. Point one, to date, since the passage of the Forever GI Bill, we've implemented 28 of the 30 provisions due by the end of fiscal 18. This fall, 450,000 veterans went to school using the GI Bill. The allegation of widespread veteran homelessness due to mispayments is false. Point two, today we have 73,000 claims in the work queue. Not all involve payments. Some, some are initial applications or change of programs. Others involve payments to veterans, schools, or both. On average, on any given day, only 1% of these claims are greater than 60 days old. We work closely and continuously to monitor and prioritize these claims carefully. And point three, 
Any veteran experience a hardship will receive expedited processing. They can do this by calling 188-GI-BILL-1. Again, 888-GI-BILL-1. We know the Forever GI Bill is incredibly important to everyone. Veterans, students, Congress, VSOs, the VA, and our VBA team. The first priority I articulated when I came to VBA was that veterans should earn the benefits, receive the benefits they've earned in a manner that honors their service. What they're experiencing now with the GI Bill does not meet this high standard. Our VA team is committed to changing that. Thank you, Chairman Arrington, Ranking Member Warp. This concludes my testimony. I look forward to answering questions subcommittee has. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence. Mr. Crow, you're now recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Chairman Arrington, Ranking Member O'Rourke, and members of the subcommittee. I am Richard Crow, a senior vice president at Booz Allen Hamilton and the client service officer for Booz Allen's health account. I am pleased to be here with you today to discuss the continued implementation of the Harry W. Colmary Veterans Education Assistance Act of 2017, Colmary Act. Booz Allen's commitment to serving our nation's veterans is strongly embedded in our culture. Booz Allen was founded by a veteran, and we have supported the Department of Veterans Affairs continuously since 1952. Approximately one-third of Booz Allen's over 24,000 employees are military-connected. That means they're either a veteran in the reserves, the National Guard, or a military spouse, and we invest heavily in helping our military-connected employees through career building, benefits, and formal military spousal support programs. Booz Allen currently supports Colmary Act implementation of part of its contract with the Department of Veterans Affairs for the benefits integration platform. In Booz Allen's role as the software developer, we are responsible for translating each of the VA's identified requirements into software code. The VA takes the lead in mapping and determining the results <coughs> for each user case based upon the VA's interpretation of the relevant statute, regulations, policy, and business rules associated with the benefits programs themselves. As software developers, it's our job to ensure that the code produces the desired results. Booz Allen appreciates this opportunity to discuss the decision not to go live with the Colmary Act sections 107 and 501 updates by August 1st of this year. Simply stated, the heavy volume of changes to the department's business rules shifted the way in which housing allowances are paid in a manner that introduced more variables. The Colmary Act revisions required both new business rules and new policy determinations by the VA to meet the new law. As a result, we rewrote 60% of the code for the long-term uh, long solution system we are charged with modernizing. From Booz Allen's vantage point, two of the primary factors driving the time frame for implementation of the revised rules have been the heavy and necessary reliance on other legacy IT systems outside of our control, as well as the old age of the underlying IT systems. Since no single database contains all the information required to assess benefits eligibility, we must obtain the necessary data from four other VA legacy IT systems that are outside the Booz Allen's contractual responsibility. We rely heavily on the VA and its contractors with responsibility over these legacy systems to navigate the data integration challenges posed by these systems' dependencies. From an age perspective, many of these underlying systems are passed at or very near their intended dates for retirement. As a result, we have had to program an elaborate set of interfaces to draw from these different and dated systems. These workarounds are time consuming, data intensive, and have, have required further system design, coordinated testing, and requirements validation. In summary, from Booz Allen's perspective, the challenges we have faced involved endeavoring to build something new on top of something very old. Despite these challenges, I'd be remiss not to highlight many of the key successes of the BIP program. We have helped the VA achieve greater efficiencies and implement best practices during this release process that will improve the overall efficiency of this process moving forward. Further, in parallel to this effort, we have been working with the VA to implement the modernization plans in other areas that continue to drive toward the VA's goals of a modern microservices-based technology stack in short, we've been helping the VA reduce the obstacles encountered here for the benefit of all future modernization efforts in the esteemed veteran population we collectively serve. I look forward to discussing these successes, as well as these challenges, in greater detail at the subcommittee. For me, there's nothing more professionally rewarding than helping the Veterans Affairs transform their technology as to make it easier for our nation's veterans to access the benefits they have earned and so richly deserve. We look forward to continuing to provide support to the Department of Veterans Affairs 
as they enhance education benefits for veterans, service members, families, and survivors through the implementation of the Comary Act. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before the subcommittee today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Crow. I now yield myself five minutes for questions. Um, Dr. Lawrence or General Worley, how many veterans, student veterans, have still not received a payment at this point? Full payment. Full payment. Housing stipend related payments. Mr. Chairman, at this, uh, at this point, I would characterize the pending inventory or the work queue that we're talking about at 73,000 as a fairly uh, normal and manageable work queue. So there shouldn't be anybody at this point um, you know, with late payments per se. We're continuing to work those that we've heard are, have hardships uh, and uh, addressing those immediately. Um, but we're at a, a relatively normal inventory today. So 73,000 student veterans have not received payment yet? No, sir. Okay. Uh, the 73,000 number, as Dr. Lawrence uh, articulated, represents claims that could be one day old or greater than 60 days old. So it's the whole range of our work queue that is pending for our claims examiners to work on. Um, of those, you know, most of them are less than 30 days old. And so that's, that's the work queue that people need to work on. And some of those don't involve payments. They're just changes to a program or their original claims that don't involve a payment. And then others do involve payments to schools or veterans. Dr. Lawrence, I heard the gentleman from Booz Allen mention legacy systems. I, I heard you talk about codes and zip codes and other codes. And do you think the, the fact that there are antiquated systems in place, uh, maybe unnecessary, maybe duplicative, but certainly older systems, is that, a, is that a part of the problem here? Sure. Uh, yes, sir. I think the problem is a couple fold. I tried to explain in my opening statement sort of the new business problem that was introduced with the housing allowance. In addition, as, as Mr. Crow pointed out, we're using legacy systems, and it's not plug and play. It's very complicated. Part of the reason Mr. James is here from OIT to help explain this, and maybe you can jump in and Sure. Uh, Chairman, I'm putting up a, a chart here, and, and that's basically the uh, education engine, if you will, the edu education IT engine. And you can see all the different parts and pieces and boxes on there. Um, the yellow box at the bottom in the middle there, that's the LTS box. And that's the one that uh, uh, Rich Crow here was talking about, where most of the, the Booz Allen uh, work, in fact, all of it has been focused on. But the surrounding boxes on that chart, on that engine, uh, those are all the legacy, the old legacy components. Some of them are, um, are 50 years old, for example. The BDN is an example of 50 years old code. And Sir, so can I, let me just ask you in the answer, because I'm going to run out of time before you get through that chart, I guarantee you. But the legacy issues, the boxes around there that aren't plugging and playing with the fixes that... Uh, Mr. Crow and his uh, outfit are, are trying to implement to get this provision implemented. Um, why are they legacy issues? Why are those boxes not up to date? I know that I've been on this committee now two years, my first full term, and we have spent hundreds of millions of dollars on IT solutions. Why are those still problematic? That's a lot of boxes around that yellow box. Right. Yes, ch uh, Chairman. Uh, that system is complex. Um, that engine is old, uh, and they. Those Why is it though? I guess my question is: if you, if we've given the resources to the VA to implement IT solutions that work, so that we can get these good reform bills, these bipartisan reform fixes and and solutions to help our veterans, but they get stalled out on account. Of, what do you need if if it's right. not the hundreds of millions of dollars that we've that we've, that the taxpayers have so generously given you to serve the veterans. What else do you need? Yes, I understand the question, uh, Chairman. Um, we had a, a broad modernization effort in place called the Benefits Integration Platform, or BIP, which was to modernize the whole engine, all the pieces on that engine. Uh, when? Uh, that was prior to passing of Colmery Act. When Colmery Act passed, what effectively happened was if you take that LTS as the carburetor, Comoriac said, hey, uh, build a fuel injector uh, with 450,000 parts that plugs into that engine. 
the rest of the engine hasn't been changed, but the LTS part is the modernization. So we shifted from broad modernization to focus on Colmariac because we had a deadline to achieve. So with that, all that understood um, and the challenges that were recognized, I'm sure early before we even ventured to implement this section, this provision of the new GI Bill, Dr. Lawrence and, and General Worley, why give us a timeline that said we'd be ready for the fall or we'd be ready in another 30 days? Uh, why not say we may never, we may, it may be a year because of the legacy issues. Y'all should know when you're trying to pass this, this legislation that it may be a year before the veteran ever sees a, an efficient implementation of this. And, and, and when you answer, after you answer that, I'm going to then defer to my ranking member for uh, five minutes and comments and questions he might have. That was unfortunate and you are correct. That was a mistake to give you a date with we did not understand the certainty around it, which is why now we are not giving you a date to so address ranking members' concerns. You will not leave this hearing with a date because as we told you in mid-September, we were in the testing part of this work and when we would not give a date until we had certainty in part based on our learnings from this experience as well as our understanding that the problem had grown more complex. I defer now to uh, Mr. O'Rourke for five minutes. Dr. Lawrence, not, not very encouraging. Um, I think in your testimony, you failed to account for the scope of the problem, uh, minimized the problem, and, and try to remind us that, you know, VBA is doing great work in many cases, which I don't think anyone here would contest. But there's the very real problem that veterans who have earned this benefit are not receiving the payments that they need to complete their education. I'd, I'd love to have some specifics, and I will challenge you to give us a, a deadline. Just because you all missed the last deadline, even though we met with you two weeks before that deadline, um, where, where I think you could have shown a little bit more candor, um, doesn't mean that you don't get to have a deadline going forward. That's a recipe for disaster, if I've ever heard one. How many, how many veterans uh, have outstanding payments greater than 30 days? And we have a 60-day number. Uh, Ranking Member O'Rourke, I, I have a greater than 60-day number. For today, it's, it's 1,000 uh, claims that are pending over 60 days. Uh, as you, you can understand, each day it's a different number because some become yeah. over 60 days and some get worked, many get worked. Um, we've worked uh, many thousands of, of claims in that ballpark. We focused on the older claims, uh, especially over the last uh, two months to make sure we get those down. And those numbers have come down over time. Why, why do you not have over 30 days? Why, why can't you give me that number? Uh, if you give me a minute, I might have it. In a, in okay. A paper. Seems like a, a question we would anticipate. We're, we're trying to you know, again, it's minimized by saying there are a lot of them who are only a day old, two days old in the system. I think we all get that. What we want to know is what the problem is, what the universe of that problem is, and how you're going to fix it. So I, I'd love to know how we're going to help those who are waiting more than 60 days, which is 1,000, you said. I'd love to know the number for greater than 30 days, how we're going to help them, how soon we're going to help them, what your deadline is to help them, and then how we can be assured that those who are under 30 days will not be over 30 days uh, going forward. What, what's the plan to do that? It looks like uh, uh, as of today, we have um, a little over 10,000 that are between the 31 and 60 day uh, mark. Um, and the plan going forward is to continue our overtime work, continue to have uh, the uh, improved uh, processing provided by 200 additional processors. Uh, we're focusing, as I said, on the old work first. We're handling hardships as they come in, and that's the ongoing uh, effort that we've gone through since um, uh, since October, uh, or since the peak of this fall, which was 207,000 claims on September 14th, uh, we've reduced the inventory by 64%. So we've brought it down continuously since that time. We're in, we're in normal processing range now, and our timeliness is very close to our targets, which is 28 days for original claims and 14 days for uh, supplemental claims. General Worley, in the backup that I received, uh, we show a 27% increase in pending in products as compared to the previous year on this date. You, you said it was, it was a comparable caseload. Is that 27% increase um, correct? 
It is correct, uh, Mr. O'Rourke, and I would just characterize that by saying a normal, uh, in the past five, six years actually, since, uh, sub, since automation was put into place with long-term solution in September of 2012, our peak periods in, in the fall and in the spring are manageable peaks. They're somewhere between 100 and 150,000 is where we get to the peak. Yes, there's a few days additional in our timeliness, but uh, people don't miss payments for the most part. So when I say uh, we're manageable uh, today, uh, even though it's 27% higher than last year, again, we're in the 73,000 range right now of our work queue, and that's something that we can maintain our timeliness with the workforce we have. General Worley, do you have an idea of how many um, students have not been able to enroll uh, in classes because they have not received tuition payments? I'm assuming when you mentioned hardship cases, that would fall into that category or urgent cases? Most of the urgent cases we've received uh, seem to be issues related to housing or potential eviction. Uh, we've received very few uh, what I would call confirmed cases of anyone actually being uh, evicted and very few, actually I don't know of any cases where someone uh, that has come to my attention where someone has not been able to enroll in school. We went out to the schools with the communication asking them to understand that they would be paid and to not take, uh, you know, not to penalize the veterans going to their schools. Thank you. Thank the ranking member and uh, now recognize our chairman, Dr. Phil Rowe, for five minutes. I, I will uh, I'll yield to uh, here. I'm just going to order. Chairman now yields five minutes to uh, Mr. Bill Rockus. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it very much. Uh, Dr. Lawrence, uh, these problems have been ongoing since the beginning of the semester. Uh, we're almost at the end of the fall semester. And most students in schools are already planning for spring semester. It's my understanding that the VA will have to go back, rework, and verify hundreds of thousands of claims once the LTS modifications are complete. What steps is the VA taking to ensure that the reworking of these claims will not have a lasting impact on spring semester claims? You have it exactly right, sir. When the new software works, we'll have to go back and recompute everybody who was in fall, and we'll have to do the reconciliation you spoke about. In our modeling, what we've sought to do is figure out how we will balance that with the spring semester so we don't have the problems we ran into that Mr. Worley just described. So our anticipation is that when it goes live, we will actually sit down and do the computations you're describing to figure out how it does not affect um, the spring semester. That's correct. So That's where will we be as far as the modifications? Excuse me? Say on January 1st. Me? I'm sorry. I, I, I'm a, as far I'm, as the modifications, uh, where do you think we, where do you expect to be, let's say on a, January 1st, the beginning of next semester? Right now, given where we are in the testing process and our inability to understand exactly when the testing will be complete, I'm estimating right now, which will be subject to our continuing through testing, that we'll be processing manually and we will not have done those reconciliations yet. So that'll be your backup plan? Probably. That'll be the plan we'll execute pending the, pending the completion of the software. Okay, there's so much uncertainty among our, our students, our heroes, our veterans, uh, given the delays that have already occurred. Do you expect the same type of delays we saw earlier this year? And as a follow-up, I have Go, go ahead. Do you expect the, the type so, of delays that we saw this year? No, I do I not. Think they're no, no, I do not expect those delays in the spring. In this fall, what happened was we waited for the technology, which did not arrive, as you've been kind enough to point out. We then allowed the schools to enroll, receiving all the work that we would have happened through the late, late summer and early fall at one time. This caused the backlog that led to the delays everybody's described. Presently, we're not planning to wait. If we do not have the software in place soon, we'll open the enrollment for the spring semester, and it will happen just like Mr. Worley described, per a normal cadence, and we'll manage it like we've always done, and it will be a regular process. The communications will be, again, a regular and consistent explaining this to everybody. Okay, uh, I have a bill, uh, H.R. 4830, the SIP Rep Act, uh, that passed the House, and uh, what it does is takes the pressure off the veterans and make sure that the, these universities, whether they're vocational universities, community colleges, do not put pressure on the veterans, because I understand that they have been, uh, to a certain extent, uh, putting pressure on them to get loans, to pay off. Uh, and we're talking about, you know, I know we're talking about housing allowance as well, but the tuitions. And, uh, 
and uh, I recommend that the Senate move on that quickly because I don't want to put pressure on that. They've got enough problems uh, transitioning into the private sector. Uh, and uh, again, we've got to do everything for our veterans. So uh, I don't know what your opinion is on that particular bill, uh, but you're welcome to give it if you like. I understand we support it. We support anything that helps veterans. All right, very good. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bilirakis. The Chairman now yields five minutes to Mr. Ticano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before this hearing, um, I had a chance to review the transcript of the last hearing we had on this issue in July, where Chairman Arrington repeatedly asked VA if it had everything it needed uh, to be ready in time. And the answer was that despite the heavy lift, VA was prepared for any glitches. Obviously, that was not the case. It was a huge bipartisan effort to make these changes uh, to better serve veterans and to make sure that we gave VA everything it asked for. So it is frustrating to be here. And as Chairman Arrington said, resources were offered and have been given in copious amounts. Um, so it's frustrating to be here looking at this massive failure after everything that this committee and Congress did. Uh, so Dr. Lawrence, it seems to me that ultimately all of these problems stem from an IT failure. Whether it's aging infrastructure, bandwidth issues, uh, inadequate uh, user scenarios uh, that you provided to Booz Allen, um, it all stems back to IT. And we're in the mess here because of uh, because the IT doesn't work. Is that a fair characterization? A couple comments, sir. It's, it's frustrating for all of us, not just you on that side of the table. It's, we know it's frustrating for veterans. I think everybody's working very hard. IT is no doubt part of what we do, but it's a very complicated thing that we're undertaking, uh, the analogy of the carburetor. IT plays a large component, but it's a group effort, sir. Well, wait a minute. What part's IT and what part's the group? The group effort is obviously we have to translate the requirements into uh, uh, things for the coders to do, so we need to make sure those are right. We've got to run the test carefully. We've got to review the tests, and make sure we understand the different scenarios. Okay. We've got to get the IT right. If I might just interrupt. So it's not, it's not antiquated machinery. It's not... Uh, it's uh, all part of it, sir. It's all part of it. So your IT, so there's a management component. There, there was a project management issues. That's correct. Right, the team. All right, but ultimately, it's IT. It's all sort of in the realm of IT, whether it's the personnel related to IT or the machines that are out of date um, or the misguidance that was given to your, your, your contractor. So given that it's all in the IT space, you're here from educational services, right? I'm the undersecretary of benefits, sir. I'm responsible benefits, for all benefits. benefits. Okay, benefits. benefits. All right. Well, my question is, why isn't the... Um, why isn't the head of VAIT here? Why isn't he here to explain uh, or take accountability or responsibility for this failure? Mr. Sandoval. I work very closely with Mr. Sandoval. He suggested Mr. James and, and Jack show up because of their relationship with the software and the infrastructure, which we thought would be the bulk of what we would talk about today. Still, he's the guy that's where the buck stops. I don't understand why he's not here. Yeah, I, I don't expect you have an answer, but I just want to point out, Mr. Chairman, that I, I, I am befuddled as to why the, an IT debacle, you send the project managers, but you don't send the person for whom the major responsibility, uh, whose shoulders it lies. All right. Um, uh, during a modernization board meeting last Friday, the education services team was asked if there was anything uh, that could have been done differently to have prevented this from happening, and the answer was no. That answer implies that VA does not believe that they made any mistakes or did anything wrong. Now, I, know, I don't know how VA could s represent that in, in that meeting uh, when so many student veterans have been harmed so severely by these, by these failures. So I'd like to ask you today, um, if you were to start this process again, what would you have done differently be beyond not telling the committee uh, that you could have gotten this done by a certain deadline? 
Um, let's, let's, a couple things, sir. At the modernization board, I, re I remember that was said. It was repeated to me. I was not at the meeting. I was actually working on this problem in front of us now. I wish what, what they had said is we haven't had time yet to digest the full range of experience. But, to it, answer. but, but it was your team. I understand. And I, what I wish they had said was it hasn't had died. We've been so focused on completing the problem at hand, we haven't had time to digest the whole range and answer that right, question let me, adequately. Let me switch up my question because I don't want to, like, re I mean, rehash. I mean, obviously, mistakes were made and people made mistakes. Mistakes. But going forward, in, in order to get, I know you don't want to give us a, a, a timeline, but I think I want to challenge you as Mr. as the ranking member has challenged you to come up with a timeline. What do we need to do? What do you need from us? Anything more that you need from us? I, I mean, it's embarrassing, to, you know, I think it's embarrassing that for you to maybe ask after all that we've given you, but what do we need to do? How, how do we, what do we need to support you in making this right? I would just say, uh, Congressman, that in terms of what to do differently, uh, as Dr. Lawrence described, the reason we had the uh, high peak numbers for the fall was that planning on a successful IT deployment in, in July, we told schools to hold their enrollments uh, where there were multiple campuses involved so, uh, so as to avoid extra work for both the schools and the VA. When we released their, uh, the ability for them and told them, go ahead and send them in in July, we got six months of work in about two months. So one thing we're going to do is not do that again uh, for the spring semester uh, to make sure that we have the normal flow of receipts through the spring and we can address them. And if, if I could take one, one more minute to in, uh, illustrate the complexity of Section 501 and 107 of the Comary Act. Uh, under Section 501, you could have three students sitting in a classroom, uh, all GI Bill students going to the same class at the same time, getting three different housing allowances, just as it relates to Section three, uh, 501 because of when they started to use their benefits. Add on top of that, if the, if the three of them were taking a majority of their classes in different locations, uh, yet again they would have a different housing allowance. These are some of the kinds of scenarios that make this a very complex problem to solve. Mr. Chairman, I apologize for going over. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Takano. I now yield uh, five minutes to the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Banks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Lawrence and General Worley, I appreciate you attending this hearing and taking responsibility for these problems, which seem to hinge on legacy system integration issues. Without a doubt, everyone's main concern is that student veterans receive the benefits they have earned and that their lives are not disrupted. But I'm also concerned with why the system glitches keep happening. Many of VA's IT systems are decades old, disjointed and written in outdated software languages. BDN, LTS, and the related educational and housing benefit systems are more the rule than the exception. Mr. James and Mr. Galvin, I have not had the opportunity to meet you yet. But I know it will not surprise you that this is very similar to the issues that we are examining with the Technology Modernization Subcommittee. Mr. Crow, as you know, your company is the lead support contractor to VA in the EHR modernization program. I am concerned that VA does not seem to have the capacity or maybe the strategy in place to handle these modernizations. You seem to dive in without a solid understanding of all the dependencies and touch points in these legacy systems. So you wind up inventing and reinventing the plan throughout the project every single time. As if no one looks under the hood of these systems for years and years until suddenly you are in there re re rewiring them like we are today. We have to build up the capacity and change the strategy or this will happen again and again and again. I think the IT system for the caregiver expansion is probably next. So to get to my question, Dr. Lawrence, VA's contract with Booz Allen originally required that, quote, each build shall be three months or less. That means delivering a completed functional piece of software every three months. Maybe not the entire software package, but a piece that can be used. But in April of this year, VA and Booz Allen agreed to change that contract language by adding, quote, unless otherwise agreed upon by the government and the contractor. Why'd you do that? I'm going to defer to the bill as he's closer to the IT contract. 
Congressman, I, I don't have the details on the why that happened. I'd like to take that for record to understand, to give you a perfect answer. Okay. Um, so, it's uh, an answer I expected. So, when the original deadline or expectation when the system modification implement section 107, um, when, when was the original deadline or expectation of when, when the system modifications implement section 107 that they would be completed? What was your original? Our original schedule? plan was July 16th to deploy the software. And um, as we testified at, at, in July, um, we, at that time, we, we had realized... So July, 2000, that, July 2018. Yes, sir. So what did the VA already know in April that motivated you to undo the requirements that software be delivered in three months? Congressman, I don't have an answer for that. Okay, that's what I expected too. So the language I quoted clearly does pertain... Um, to the work that we are discussing today. It comes from Id line item 4001 in your contract, which you have so far funded at $69 million. Um, you want to comment on that? You want to comment on that? Funded at the tune of $69 million for that line item, is that your suggestion? Because is that your understanding as well? I don't know about the f budget or the funding for it, but I believe we've paid out 647,000 to date on that line item. Okay, well, we'll dig into that even more. So, Mr. Chairman, I think this might be a what did they know and when did they know it type of question. And uh, I've got more questions for round two, but with that, I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Banks. Uh, we now yield uh, five minutes to Mr. Correa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for holding this most important hearing. And as I'm listening to all of this the history, I'm asking myself and the committee, are we destined to live with these IT failures irrespective of how much money, uh, taxpayer dollars we invest, We're trying to take care of our men and women who are coming back after serving our country? Uh, gentlemen, I, this last weekend I was at a opening of a vet center in my district, Chapman University. Young man coming back from fighting for our country, ready to get their education, and I'll tell you, walking in, with this scenario, it's kind of embarrassing, and it, it's shameful uh, to me, and I think to us. Um, you talk about a, a teamwork. You talk about your schematics, teamwork. I hope we're part of that team when it comes to executing. So um, gave us a July 16th deadline uh, to come up with some solutions. I understand this is IT. It's very complex, as you said. But I guess if we're part of a team, why did it take the committee staff, a, a you know, visit by the committee staff to Oklahoma to figure out that something was going on, something was not going right? Why didn't that information, why was that not conveyed to this committee that things were not on schedule? The... Um since I arrived in May, part of what I've been doing is working closely with OI&T is what are the technology challenges we've faced. We identified that latency and the connectivity to our offices was a problem. Working with OIT, we first started by dealing with the way we communicate, call it the bandwidth, the pipes to the offices. We expanded those. When that didn't work, we noticed the software still uh, locked up, as your staff discovered. We were in the process of examining why the software conflicted when your team went to visit. What they saw is what we knew what was going on and what we were working on. It would be inaccurate to say their visit motivated us to deal with it because we were already dealing with it. So let me But their visit was the way this committee was made appraised or made uh, informed of the fact that things were not going well. I'm not saying you you're hiding it from us, but you didn't yeah, tell yeah. us things were not going right. So, sure, I think in our regular conversations with you, we focused on the software development, and I think we were meeting almost weekly to explain to your team what we were doing. I believe the agenda was an hour long, and it focused on the software development of that. That was not included in the, uh, the agenda, and it was an oversight. So if we don't include it in the agenda, you see that something's wrong. Should you bring it up to our attention? Those are standard challenges we were dealing with. I would not be bringing those to you because we were dealing with those. 
So you're part of the team, but we would escalate accordingly, and I thought the so software You have a situation was, where students may have challenges, and in your words, you think no, it's sir. false that any of their students are having no, homeless sir. issues. No, sir. Your team saw us struggling to process. Well, what they admitted, and it was pointed out, a five-minute task was taking 45 minutes. Students weren't suffering. We were processing through overtime. To your knowledge, work. they're not suffering. No, I said that people have suffered because of the backlog that Mr. Worley described. But what your team saw was five-minute tasks taking 45 minutes. That was our internal issue. We were working. Should our teams also go to Buffalo and St. Louis to see if there are any issues? In, in there are the same issues well. there that we have addressed the same way, first by working on the bandwidth, then by deconflicting the software. If we're going to work as a team, and yet we don't have this information, how can we be a better team? I'm, I'm, I'm perplexed about the lack of information. We regularly send to your staff weekly reports that I would consider management reports that you're welcome to delve into. And I'm personally, I'm happy to come brief you on what you're seeing. You're seeing what our leaders are seeing in terms of our operational performance. So I'm, I'll be happy to come sit down and talk you through it. I would love to have you come talk to the committee and essentially tell us those issues which you believe are, are coming forth. What are the challenges that are not being met, so to speak? Certainly. What are the I'm problems happy that, I'm happy that are coming up with? Mr. Chairman, I yield. Thank you, Mr. Correa. Now recognize Mr. Mass uh, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, let's move in the other direction of people not being paid. How many people do you anticipate are going to have disruptions in their lives as a result of being overpaid because of miscalculation? Thank you for the opportunity to address that. Um, because of the lack of our IT uh, implementation, so we are paying incorrect housing to, uh, to our beneficiaries. Uh, depending on when they start at school, some of those beneficiaries are receiving about $69 uh, more than they should be getting because we haven't uh, applied the new DOD rate to them. Uh, others who are existing students already um, are are not receiving about a 1%, a little less than 1% uh, increase that uh, was implemented on, uh, with the DOD rates and that should have been implemented August 1st. So we don't have the breakout of the exact numbers, sir, on which of those um, are, you know, which is which, but uh, as we have said, uh, we will not go back and try to recover the overpayments once the IT fix is in and where we have underpaid our beneficiaries, we will make them whole at the time the IT fix goes. So you, you expressed before that this is difficult. In the classroom, there can be a number of different scenarios. Somebody could be a distant student from this place, but showing up for a one or two time class at some other place, or they could live in one place, but be attending uh, courses in another location. Is there any parameters in which you're intending to claw back dollars from veteran students under any part of this that, that has gone on, any of those situations, of those numerous complex situations that you said can exist in any given classroom? Are there any situations that you intend to, be claw, to, to claw back dollars? We will not claw back anything that is uh, related to our lack of implementing sections 107 and 501, sir. Have you written any letters to students alerting them to the fact that they may be being overpaid as we speak and that you do not intend to claw back dollars from them? Uh, through September and October, we sent uh, uh, nearly an email a week to, to 35,000 schools and over 300,000 students uh, telling them about the payment delays and uh, letting them know that we would not, um, again, not, not uh, establish debts against them. Let's move in a slightly different direction. You said already you don't intend to, to indicate the completion date, that it's very complex again. Can you tell us a little bit about the testing that's going on right now? How much of a priority is this testing? How many people do you have working on this issue? How many people do you have working on this issue? We've uh, turned over uh, re release candidate 27 on November 7th. User acceptance testing is being conducted by the VA. Um, as, I, as far as the staffing level of user accepting testing, that's a VA process, so I'd have Mr. to... Mr. Lawrence, how many people are working on testing? I, I think in total, including the contractors and the VA, we're about 100 people uh, involved right now today, you know, testing, coding, fixing, uh, working on all that software. All day? Sole, that's their sole function? They're working on this all day? Yes, sir. 
we, we're, sir, we're also working through the weekend on this. Through the weekends yes. as well? Is there a school that you're currently testing somewhere that's, that has live testing going on where this, is, this can be looked at to say it's working or not working well? The way we're doing it, sir, is um, <clears throat> subject matter experts from the VA take the software through its paces, and they're really pushing it through real-world scenarios. I have software developers who are- Where are these real-world scenarios? Dr. Lawrence. <clears throat> They're written in user acceptance testing, their use cases. They model the, the behavior students would be doing, as Rob pointed out, the different variations they would have. And we use them to test the software to make sure the results are as we would expect them to do. And when they don't go as we expect them to do, that's the testing part. We go back and talk about why that is. And no schools being live tested right now. No, the schools, these are user, these are user, um, these are use cases that we've developed, so they're tested in our tested environment. They're based on the experience students would have. So there could still be problems once you actually put this into the, the live environment of various different schools around the country, depending on what their IT infrastructure might exist, how their IT infrastructure. That is what we're trying to avoid, which is why this testing period is so time. We have a series of use cases that we want to pass. So when what you're describing happens, it's such a small percentage of the total, we're able to deal with that. Thank you, I have one more question. Uh, Mr. Crow, is there a, an additional bill coming from Booz Allen Hamilton, or do you plan on an additional bill coming from Booz Allen Hamilton for all of this additional testing and the extra man hours and the extra people that you have to get to work on these issues? So today, we, <clears throat> for section 501 and 107, we have not invoiced the VA. Uh, we continue to work against our funding line, and we're, commi we're committed to getting this, uh, getting this deployed to serve the veteran. Will you grant me one follow-on question here? Do you anticipate sending addition an additional bill? Uh, for the functionality that was delivered now, no. If there's additional functionality that's requested, obviously we would have to look at it then. I yield back, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Mass. I now recognize Chairman uh, Rowe for five minutes. Thank you. But one of the things that the VA has gotten right is they named this long-term solution, right? It, that's appropriate. It's going to take a long time to get this solution, it looks like. Let me, let me put this in real terms. Um, young soldier with a two-year-old, probably not three figures in a bank account. Probably not three figures, not four, but probably not three. With a 1974 used Dodge Colt with a straight stick shift looking for the GI Bill to help him when he went back to school. That was me. And I got the money on time, without all the computers, without all the nonsense, I got a check every month from the VA, not a single hiccup, 1975. And today, with all this technology and millions and millions and millions of dollars spent, Amazon has, by, by June of this year, excuse me, by August of this year, I know because a company in my district makes them, it sent out a billion articles to people and gotten, I think, probably most of it exactly right. And that's a frustration I have, that we've spent all this money and time and we can't get a paycheck out to somebody. And I know Mr. Correa brought up uh, as something that I want to follow along. How many claims have we actually gotten right as of right now, when the school is in session, we've done hundreds of, I know you guys have done hundreds of thousands of them. How many have gotten, been done right and correctly? How much, how many schools got the right number? How many veterans got the, how many students got the right check? Chairman Rove, literally thousands upon thousands of our beneficiaries have received uh, payments on time. And correct. Uh, and correct. Well, no, not for the housing because the new rates are not in the system. But otherwise, you know, like I said, some are getting paid over, and over a little bit, some are a little and bit let's, less. Then let's go to that. This, this, because of this IT failure, this is not only, I mean, the, the Fair GI Bill is a tremendous bill. I think both sides of the aisle can take great pride in that, and the country can take great pride in it. It was transformational after World War II. And I know to this day I appreciate the $300 a month that I got uh, back in 1975 and 1976. I'm appreciative of that to this day. It helped me and my family a lot. But a lot of these people are out there like I had with absolutely no money sweating the end of the month and sweating, can I keep my apartment? Am I going to have enough to feed my kids and so forth? And we're, how much money have we spent instead of getting those benefits to students in overtime 
and in IT. And that's what I want to know is how much money have we spent just implementing this because the system didn't work. And I want to follow that up, Mr. Crow, with this question to you is what is your assessment of the LTS modifications and do you believe that you have delivered the product that you're required to produce? Um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, sir. We delivered on July 27th, we delivered release candidate 18, which satisfied the requirements at the time uh, we were asked to deliver. And at that time, um, we believed it to be based on our understanding of the software defect free. It, when it, the VA was testing, user acceptance testing began in June. They were continuing to do testing. We were marching towards an August 1st uh, delivery date and uh, what, you know, subsequent testing identified new issues with the software largely around variations of these user cases as, you know, I think Mr. Mast even mentioned all these different permeation, permutations of, uh, of um, housing. Subsequent to that, I think very prudently the VA took a pause to reassess requirements and see if there was additional functionality which yielded 83 new user cases which we built to. We delivered that software on November 7th and released candidate number, release candidate 27. That has been under testing since November 7th. As of 2.53 today, there is no critical defects with that software. Okay, and Mr. James, if Mr. Crow believes that the product's ready, you've been given the user acceptance testing now for, I guess, a week or two, why is the system not ready? I know the other bugs in there that VA or Booz Allen need to fix. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, so that module may be ready from the, uh, you know, the perspective of, of meeting its specifications. But what happens now is that the surrounding modules that we saw on that diagram, um, they now have to be changed to uh, get the bugs out that you know are reflective of the new carburetor we just installed. So there are, are issues in one of those systems called VA once, and there are issues in Weems that were discovered in user testing at the end of October. So now those surrounding systems have to be fixed. And once you fix those, you're gonna to have to regression test the module that Rich just talked about. So, so yes. We have, no, we have no earthly idea when this is gonna be ready. That is, and so I guess the thing, the takeaway I want for students out there watching or in school today, what can they expect mid-January when they go back to class after the Christmas break when they go to, can they, can we sit here with a straight face and tell these students that your school's going to get paid and you're going to get your check in a timely fashion? Can we say that to them now, today? The, the answer to that question is yes. As Mr. Worley just pointed out, what you're not getting, as long as the software is not done, is the new housing allowance per the new GI Bill. That's what's different. You're getting the old payment but you are getting a payment, you are able to go to school, and your school will be paid. At the end of the day, and I'll yield back, I'm, I'm sorry for going over, at, at the end of the day, I wanna know how much this overtime and how much this uh, payment that we're not gonna claw back has cost the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. We will follow up on that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, we now recognize uh, Mr. Kaufman for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If, if I can go back, um, uh, Dr. Lawrence, to what you just mentioned in, in the old payment versus the new payment. The old payment versus the location of the, the institution, the school, uh, versus the new payment, which is far more complicated, uh, could be multiple institutions, uh, uh, each with varying amounts. But, but what you said was, that they're receiving payment on the old system. But my concern is not the, the institution, not the school, uh, but it's the, uh, the veteran uh, on the housing side uh, in particular. Usually, um, I know property management firms having been in the business give about a five day grace period at the beginning of the month for the payment of rent. And so, um, and these are renters, they're, they're not, by, I, I went to uh, school on the, on the GI Bill, uh, not homeowners. And so um, tell me about, let, let's drill down on the housing component of this, uh, actually the, the living component of this, because it's more than just housing, uh, to the veteran. And, and are they, so when you talk about 
the old payment versus the new payment. Are they receiving the old payment, though, on a timely basis? Yes, that's what, yes, that's what we've been describing. And I'll ask Mr. Worley to jump in here. This is where he talked about the new rates are, on average, 1 percent higher. So you're getting the old rates, okay, using the old computation. In addition, we've been very concerned about exactly the situation you're describing, which is why we identified expedited route to get payments. We've worked with VSOs, your staff, to identify anybody who would say, I'm in a, I'm in a hardship situation. We found about 1,000 of those people. And I will tell you, every time we've looked where someone said, there's widespread activity where people are, we found that not to be true. So we are very concerned about this and are trying to get people paid exactly for that reason, but we are not finding that systematically happening. Okay. But certainly, uh, um, I admit that the, I've not received the, the, the volume of complaints in my office, uh, but, but we certainly have read press stories about individuals not receiving anything on the housing side. Why don't you comment on that? We've looked at those stories, sir, and it's, you know, it's hard to speak more broadly, but I wouldn't talk specifically. When we've gone and found those, they are generally not true. We've tried to find, as Mr. Roy said, we have no confirmed cases of somebody being evicted. They've either not told us, but we found people. There's a story today in the, wall, in the Washington Post that cites three veterans. We know the story of those three veterans. I cannot share them with you because it's personal information, but I'm more than happy to do so in private. And that story misrepresents the facts. Okay, so the, it's, it's the delta between the old system and the new system that they're, that they're not getting on a timely basis. That's correct. Okay, so, but w one thing going back uh, that I have a concern about, um, and hopefully we'll get this corrected going forward. How did this happen where we come up with legislation uh, and we're relying upon the expertise of the Department of Veterans Affairs to tell us whether or not the, the, the implementation uh, date, the effective date of the legislation is realistic or not? And so the, the Congress of the United States was not given uh, accurate information as to the implementation. How did that happen? I mean, we rely on you to opine in, in, the, in hearings like this. I mean, you are given the VA, Department of Veterans Affairs, is always given an opportunity to comment on every single bill before this committee. Uh, and, and your support, your, your, whether you support it, whether you don't support it, whether it's realistic on the implementation side or not realistic on the implementation side. And we were not given adequate information. But could you comment on that? If I could take that one, uh, sure. sir. Um, you're, you're exactly right. We've, we, uh, as you know, first of all, the Forever GI Bill, the, the set of uh, provisions was um, put together in, a, in, in record time and passed into law and signed into law in record time. Um, when we commented on those provisions uh, in support of the legislation, uh, then we, we tell, you know, we tell you all that uh, which provisions require significant IT um, work. And so I would suggest to you that we um, typically say we need at least a year uh, or about a year to do IT work. We don't usually project beyond that because at, at the time uh, we review these provisions, we're, we're not sh sure exactly of the complete uh, requirements that might go with it. So uh, I would just... Well, I mean, what do you mean you're not sure about the complete requirements? How would you... How can you say that? Well, I would say that uh, until you delve into the code, as we've described, uh, you may not appreciate, especially when it comes to the housing calculation, which is fundamental in the, in the depth of the code of long-term solution, uh, how many scenarios you could have. Uh, once the provisions are passed, sir, we spend a lot of time with our general counsel and with your staffs making sure we understand the intent of Congress and the various interpretations that we might have to make as we implement uh, this bill. We did this with every provision of the Comeri Act as we got ready to implement it. So, uh, so there is new discovery sometimes between the time we have commented and supported legislation and give you views and costs uh, to the time it actually gets implemented. I think there's just a disconnect here. Mr. Crow, I mean, as a professional, uh, an IT professional, I'm assuming you are, um, couldn't you assess the complexity of this and how long it would take for its implementation? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, we're software developers, and we rely on the VA for subject matter expertise in defining what the, what the user requirements are. 
they, we defer to them for, de for defining the policy, the rules, the statutes, and defining what the user cases are. And so we, we lean on them. This is one team, all right? We work very closely with them in requirements elaboration uh, starting in January uh, through April, defining 11 of the 27 cases we continue to work on. We continue to refine cases, an additional 16 cases, between April, indeed, all the way up to July 12th with user cases of scenarios. But to your quest question, Mr. Kaufman, when we got, uh, you know, I guess when user testing occurred, um, there are many, many, I guess the, the, the user acceptance testing realized that there were many, many, many more scenarios that they hadn't accounted for. And so, you know, that's, that's you know, I would not be able to look into the future. We rely on subject matter expertise from the VA. Mr. Chairman, if I can close with this, uh, you know, this administration, the Trump administration, promised to clean up the culture of bureaucratic incompetence uh, inside the VA. And, uh, and uh, based on this testimony today and, and, and other hearings we've had, I don't think they've made a lick of difference. I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kaufman. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I associate myself with that comment uh, and hope to elaborate on it uh, b before this hearing's over. Uh, the chairman now uh, recognizes and yields five minutes to Mr. Bergman, General Bergman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> it's been interesting to watch the game of whack-a-mole continue on. And we're all involved because as the committee, we're trying to take the mallet of fiscal, you know, uh, capability and give it to the VA as the different moles, you know, whack-a-moles pop up. We watch you deal with the different criteria, the different uh, software development challenges. Um, my concern, if I can articulate it, is that if we don't, to the 80 plus percent level, agree on what the parameters are and the problems we're trying to solve, knowing that technology is going to change and what we have is cutting edge technology today, tomorrow is gonna to be legacy, which we're gonna spend more money funding when the rate of technology changes to the point where now do we have to spend more money keeping up with the rate of technological change. That's one of the challenges any business has when you look at defense, especially when you're looking at things from weapon systems and all of that. Rate of technology change is always going to play a factor. What we're asking you, I believe, is give us that 80% level of change you're only going to live in so many zip codes. You're going to, only going to take so many courses. You're only going to do this. Give us that 80% level and have the parameters set so that when you get it right to the 80% level, then the other 20% that is going to occur naturally, we minimize the continual cash outlay. We minimize the pain to the veterans that can occur just through a glitch. And one of the challenges we have is that when you try to pay your credit card personally, if you can't do it online, what do you got to do? Probably got to write a check, right? Because you want to get it paid so you don't have to pay the extra you know, fee for a late payment. Somehow the VA has to have something in place to have that ability to help that veteran get that payment in a timely manner. When the eventual glitch comes. Again, you're talking a small percentage, but we have to have that backup capability. It should not be our go-to. So would anybody at the table care to basically respond to my comment? Are we going to be able to get the 80% level correct so we're not chasing legacy, new technology, legacy, new technology, and continuing to have to have Mr. Crow and his software developers keep after that. Yes, Congressman, uh, I think you um, articulated the modern way of doing software, which is to find success up front and then, you know, uh, work at that in bite-sized pieces, you know, build a little, test a little, deploy a little. That's 
what we need to get to to get out of this vicious cycle of, of maintenance and legacy software that we're in today. So there's a whole modernization effort that needs to uh, update all those boxes on that chart to get to that level of modern you know, software development. We're, we're doing it today on this LTS piece. We need to do it with the other pieces on that chart. So, yeah. well, Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, General Bergman. I'm going to go for another round of questions for the members who want to stay. I'm going to yield myself uh, five more minutes. And ask General Worley, I must say, I've been impressed with you since uh, I've taken this job and, and uh, appreciate your professionalism. I have a sense of your sincere commitment to the veterans. Um, do you have control over the IT system, um, software design, development, sort of overall IT services? Is that in your bailiwick? No, sir, not, not the... Um not the development. And well, for example, actual, with this provision and its implementation, is, is my, that your job? Uh, uh, my, Mr. Chairman, my job in this uh, development and any uh, kind of development is to define the user requirements okay. and provide those. Have you done that? To, yes, sir. You we think did they're that, clear? We did that back in November. Do you think December. they were clear, the, the user requirements? Did they receive those and we, you feel like they've been We believe they were complete and okay. clear. So the, the breakdowns on the IT side, I mean, you're you're being you're a customer of your CIO and your IT operation within the VA. Is that that a fair way to describe it? That's correct. Sir. Are you happy with the service? Are you ecstatic? Are you average? Are you so-so? Are you just really fed up and really exasperated and almost depressed that you're having to come to this uh, hearing yet again over this issue? Well, as Dr. Lawrence pointed out, we're all frustrated that we don't have the solution in place and that we Here's had what's this frustrating, issue. General, if I may. What's frustrating is we feel powerless up here because we've given you money, we've given you the authority, um, we have asked repeatedly for anything else if there are barriers uh, that we're unaware of to remove. Um, so I can't fire the CI. I don't even know who he is. I've never seen him. So. You know, Mark, great you know, point. I, I don't know who he is. Well, I don't think we have one. I think you have an acting. I think you've had an acting for a while. That is also a sort of um, a repeated uh, response. We don't have one. This person's been acting, and they've only been in the job. There's, the continuity of leadership's a real problem at the VA. Um, I think we would all acknowledge that. But we feel powerless to do anything. I can't fire anybody. I can ask you who's responsible, and have they been, and should they be. The veterans... I think feel powerless because there's not a local VA they can go to if you're not serving them. They can't go to the next corner to the VA that provides the same benefit. They're trapped. They're trapped in a monopoly in this bureaucracy and they, they can't get out of it. And so that's why we're all frustrated. But um, who is ultimately responsible uh, for this dysfunction uh, across the board, the legacy, yada, 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 that we heard, ultimately, who's responsible for that? Is it General Worley, uh, Mr. Undersecretary? L let, me, let me describe accountability. Um, as the Undersecretary of Benefits, I'm responsible for making sure uh, veterans receive checks under the GI Bill. Mr. Worley works with me with that. On the technology, the way the structure is set up, we work closely with OI&T. We work collaboratively in that sense. Okay? They're responsible for the contract with Booz Allen Hamilton. We have to work together on this. It's just the way this is set but up. But somebody's ultimately got to be accountable because if all of you are accountable, nobody's accountable. I mean, I know that you have to define the need. You have to set the expectation. You have to put the user requirements and articulate them. I'm assuming that's been done. This is an IT issue. And, it, it, and, and, and again, I, it, is, it, it feels like an exercise in futility. Just about every program and every good intention of, of this committee where we're trying to solve a problem and serve our veterans and then it's just more IT uh, rigmarole and legacy this, that, and the other and um, brokenness and dysfunction. I feel like there's a leadership issue. I feel like there's a lack of strategic management. I don't think there's a real plan for the IT architecture of this agency. I, I just think it's fundamentally broken. Uh, do you agree with that? 
Well, l let me comment. Just me, a yes or no. Do you agree with that? Comment? I don't have context that you have to respond to the broad question. You have, that you have better asked. context. You work there, let and me, they're not serving you, and you're here sure, before and that's this I've, committee. Do you believe that it's broken fundamentally? and dysfunctional because Booz Allen, I have more confidence in his expertise and he says, it, he uses the word legacy. That's a nice way of saying it's old and it's antiquated and it doesn't work well and I'm doing the best I can with this, this old antiquated system sure. that we've spent hundreds sure. of millions of dollars in expecting that you would change sure. it. I would not describe the process we are going through on this project only. Okay, where let me we just, are, Mr. We are, Mr. Uh, 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 Crow. You've seen a lot of organizations, public and private, no doubt. Um, how bad, scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the worst, relative to others that you've uh, worked with, and I understand you do a lot of business, probably billions of dollars with the VA from what I'm told. So I know it's going to be tough to muster the courage here to just say it like it is, but you've seen this, the boxes and the dysfunction. We just put it on the screen. Nobody up here knows what that means, except that those boxes aren't working together. How bad is it? One to 10 relative to your other customers. Um, well, that's a good question. Um, I would say that the legacy IT systems in the VA are, VA are very complex. It's the second largest agency in the United States behind the Department of Defense. And not surprisingly, it has a very complex system. The other thing I would point out is many of these systems. So are, are you telling me that just it's the nature of the VA, the complexity of the VA itself is the disaster of the legacy systems that you described? Or is it the fact that there's not a real IT architecture plan and effective implementation of that architecture and plan? Well, I can't speak to the entire VA because I'm not familiar with every IT system in the VA. But you're familiar with a lot of it because y'all do a lot of work for the for the VA, correct? We, we do. And my my, <clears throat> my colleague told me it was billions of dollars. Well, that's. You think it's over a billion? No, I mean, but well, I can get back to you on that. But I, I was told it was two billion, roughly two to three. Um, that's a lot of work, man. I, I hope you know that customer well. I've got I've gone over my time, way over my time. I still have questions, uh, but I don't even know if we have time, so, and I want to respect everybody's time here, um, I, but I still have questions, so I'm, I'm hoping that one of my colleagues will uh, continue with this. Um, Mr. Ranking Member, okay. five minutes. Thank you. Plus or minus. Muscle minus. Minus uh, muscle minus. Muscle minus. Um, so, just, uh, uh, so just in my opening comments, I was hoping to have some clarity in where we are and, and, and how we fix some of the outstanding issues. We have 11,000 claims over 30 days. A thousand of those are over 60 days. Um, General Worley, do we have an estimate for number of claims over 90 days? As, as you are finding that, um, I'm going to just confirm what seems to be inferred, which is that this system is not going to be ready for the spring semester. You haven't out and out said it, but you've, you've said it. If, if I'm incorrect in stating that, correct me. Um, General Worley has said, though the system will not be ready, we will, we will be able to avoid delays because we've already concluded that the system will not be ready and we're geared up to receive those claims as though the system were not ready. So, so we're not going to have those uh, additional delays. Um, my understanding to the question asked by Chairman Rowe is that we are $4 million in, in additional overtime. Um, to Mr. Banks' line of questioning, is that on the contractor if, if, if the delivery delivery was not received um, at, at the deadline agreed to in the contract, is the taxpayer going to eat every additional million dollar of, of overtime, or is that something the contractor is going to pick up? Who, who's, who's on the line for this overspending that we're seeing right now? I can address that, um, Ranking Member O'Rourke. Um, Quickly, if you could, because I have, sure. I have uh, more uh, questions. To put it into context, uh, we do most of the time voluntary overtime, and my budget for voluntary overtime in education is about $6 million a year. We needed $2 million more to get through August and September uh, to do this work. Um, again, this is mandatory. We're pulling out all the stops. In, in, nor in a normal year, we do voluntary overtime for the surge periods to make, maintain our timeliness. But I, I would That's submit if the system were working and if it were delivered on time, you would not have had to... Um, consume that overtime for this project and it could have been applied to something else. There's got to be other need there if you have that, if that budget line there. So, but I'm going to move on to other questions. Mr. Undersecretary, when will the system be ready? 
I don't have a date for you at this point, sir. What I tried to explain is we're in the process. It is not a dysfunctional process. That, it is that's a process okay. of testing um, and evaluating. And when we've completed that, we'll have a date. We told you we would tell you what, what's, right away. What's the total uh, additional cost incurred over what was first budgeted for this system, including the overtime, the $4 million? I don't know the total. We, we should know that, and, and I'm submitting that for the record, and I would love for you to get back to this committee within a week. Um, what additional costs do you project taking on in order to get this system ready? I'll take that for the record and give okay. you a Okay, we'd love to have that within a week. Um, uh, General Worley, you mentioned claims being um, completed on time. What does on time mean? Under 30 days? Our, our targets for original claims, which is the original application, is 28 days. 28, we, okay. Historically, we've done much, much better than that. And for supplemental claims, 14 days. And historically, we've been in the single digits for those with our automation. And uh, 92 uh, today, there are 92 claims that are over 90 over days. Over 90 days. Yes, Thank sir. you for that. Uh, when will you, will you resolve those 92 claims, the 1,000 the claims over 60 days, and the 10,000 um, additional claims that are over 30 Days. We, we work those every day. Uh, the reason they're that old primarily is because we're awaiting information either from the veteran, from the school, or from the Department of Defense. We've worked with the Department of Defense to get us the service information, so we work those and work them off uh, every day. They'll never get to zero because you're always going to have development going on for uh, those claims. Are, are you saying that um, from your side of the problem, you all have done as much as you can and you're awaiting responses back from the veterans or the, the educational institution or some other third party? In those cases, uh, yes, but we don't just sit around and wait. We, we you know, re-ask uh, the questions and we have systems to communicate with the DOD and others to try to get the answers that we need so that we can process the claims. Okay, and then do you need, this is something the chairman of the subcommittee was, was asking, and Mr. Takano asked as well, do you need any additional authorization or appropriation? Um, is there anything from our end that you need? At this time, and I would share the frustration of the committee, there's, we appreciate all the support of the committee. Uh, this isn't a funding issue. This isn't uh, a, a people issue per se, although we have hired additional people to work this. Uh, this is an issue of getting through the complexity of the software. Something that just came in that I would bring to your attention if you didn't already know about it. Um, Columbia University is limiting student veterans' ability to register for classes for the spring if they have outstanding balances, the result of delayed GI Bill payments. I haven't checked the veracity of this. I just would bring it to your attention. We, as this hearing has progressed, folks have been getting in touch with us on social media saying that this is the case. Um, I guess, I guess those, those are my outstanding questions, Mr. Chairman, um, and, and some of them we're waiting on the Undersecretary to get back to us on. I've asked that they be received within a week. These should be things that we know how much we've spent over the projected amount, and we should have a good estimate of what we're going to spend going forward, or we're in greater trouble than I thought. Thank you. I couldn't agree more. Uh, thank you for the line of questionings. Questioning, and um, now I recognize Mr. Banks for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Crow. Is it true that since August, when this system was supposed to go live, that you've received an additional 80 user cases from the VA, which are the requirements that the software needs to perform? And if so, have, how have these requirements impacted the timely delivery of the modifications to LTS? Sure. As, uh, as uh, Dr. Lawrence said earlier, there was a pause taken in August to take a look at the functionality and if every user case was accommodating all the many different variations uh, that you can have through Calmary. And that resulted in 83 additional user cases. From a time to implementation, we do a release code. We can turn one around overnight. So we went from, you know, working with the VA, we would uh, turn these around fairly quickly. And uh, we went from release code, I think it was 18 in August, in July, we're at release code uh, 29 right now. So it's 11 different release codes. We, we use uh, agile development and we just kind of, you know, on an iterative basis, keep working. And then as user acceptance testing uh, goes, we have people over the shoulder and if there's something that comes up or there's a defect or any kind of issue, we are doing real-time patches. And like I say, we delivered release code candidate 27 on November 7th. It's been in testing, and there's been no issues that I'm aware of, but we continue yeah, to do let it. Me, uh, let me cut, cut through all that. So 83, 
since August? That, that was a result of the pause, and it was because there was many different... But you said 27 before that. Yeah, we received, uh, we worked on 11 of them that came in in the January through April time frame. There was an additional 16 that we continued to work on that were in draft format, and we finalized the 27th one on July, I want to say it was July 20th or something like that, or July 12th. I think it was July 12th we received, and then we turned right. that around very quickly, and we were able to get a release candidate into, uh, into the VA's hands by the 27th. Okay, thank you. Mr. James. The contract is to deliver software, but strictly speaking, it buys scrum teams, which are teams of software developers to do software development sprints. You have been adding scrum teams throughout the year. How many scrum teams and software development sprints, sprints are you up to now? Congressman, I don't have the exact number. Um, so let me take that for the record. I think it was, we started with two, we added two, I think we added two more, but, uh, you know, I need to get the exact number for you. So you can't tell us how, how many scrum teams? Not off the top of my head how many scrum teams are in action today, no. Or how many people at all would be necessary to get this done? No, I, the, the development teams that are um, working in Charleston, uh, it, that's what you're referring to with the scrum teams. That's the, um, the actions and the software folks there in the Booz Allen Hamilton facility. And of course, what happens after that is that um, as software is built, then it has to get tested. Uh, there are, uh, so in terms of the scrum teams, as uh, Rich Crow just mentioned, they are able to turn around the software in response to users testing and bugs and user scenarios and so forth. But that's just step one. Now you have to go test that software. That happens in different processes and in different locations with the engagement of the users. Uh, so th the fact is that our testing tail end of this process can't keep up with the development processes, the scrum teams, as you mentioned. That's part of the technical debt that we're dealing with is that we have old testing systems and old testing processes that um, are, are catching the software code that is being developed by Booz Allen Hamilton. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Banks. I now recognize Mr. Ticano for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Lawrence, just to be clear, v VBA has stated that it will not recoup money from anyone who is overpaid by VA related to Sections 107 and 501, and uh, instead of writing it off as an administrative error. Can you please confirm this? So there my was, question there is, was a, the instead, the instead in the sentence so that we are not going to claw back money under the circumstances Mr. Worley described, yes. right? And there's no instead. It will be an administrative error. It will be an administrative error. So um, I just want to make sure that uh, folks who are watching this hearing understand and that uh, the media reports it correctly that that any no clawback of overpayments related to sections 107 and 5. Absolutely. Let me state it clearly. If you have been overpaid after we do the reconciliation, we will not come for that money. All right. Thank you. Um, it, it, General Worley, um, you say this is not an IT, it's not a money problem, not a people problem. Uh, what is the problem? What is the problem? Because I'm just, the yeah, problem what, 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 what was missing up until, are you, are you confident you, you say you have everything? Just for the record, VA has everything. I think needs. the problem has been articulated as uh, as has our I, IT colleagues have have articulated the the difficulty of uh, of of what we're trying to take on here. Um, so I think uh, throwing more money or more uh, people at it, uh, I, I defer to IT if they need more people. But uh, from my perspective, um, it's a matter of uh, continuing to do the testing and continuing to wring out the software so that we can get it right and pay our veterans correctly. Okay. Um, okay. Um, Dr. Lawrence, your ability to actually get a timeline, to get a sense of when this is going to, everything's going to be worked out. I mean, 
who are you relying on? Are the project managers to be able to tell you this? Right. There's a project management team. I work closely with the folks here to figure out where are we so we know with certainty when we give you a date, we understand what that certainty is. So again, it's the process we've been trying to describe. Test, figure out what the problems are, root cause analysis, analyze the problems, figure out the user cases and come back with the solutions. And when that's done, we'll know the date. They're accountable to you or are they accountable to ultimately uh, the head of IT, whoever is the top IT person at the VA? It's a little bit of both. Booz works for IT. IT works with me. The IT folks are solid line to the head of IT, dotted line to me. Dotted line to you. Okay. And again, I just want to state for record that the IT, head of IT, even though we, we have an acting blah, 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 so, you know, unconfirmed, uh, and that's Mr. Sandoval, and I just want to state again, he's not here, and I think that's a glaring, glaring omission. Uh, in terms of us uh, as doing oversight uh, on our part, uh, a major person who's accountable for the IT, uh, uh, has responsibility for IT, he's not here. The, the solid line goes to him, the dotted line goes to you, but the guy for whom the solid line goes to, Mr. Sandoval, he's not here. And that's, that's a fact. Noted, so, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think, Mr. Chairman, we need to, we need to talk to that guy. Um, and it seems to me that um, the, se the president the, uh, and the secretary, they need to make these appointments. They need to fill these vacancies. Uh, and this, is just not, this is a management vacancy, a critical management vacancy um, at the confirmed Senate level. We have 45,000 vacancies at the VA. 40,000 of them in, in, uh, in uh, uh, the Veterans Health Administration. But this is, this is a problem. Uh, I, want, I want to associate myself with the chairman's remarks about a continuity problem, a lack of continuity in the very top level. There's been four secretaries since I've been here in six years, four secretaries of this department. And now this critical IT position, which requires a tremendous amount of technical expertise, competence. I think what's missing is a competent person uh, who can be held accountable for what has happened. I don't even know if anyone at this table can really explain uh, what could have been done differently because that person's not here. So I would submit to Mr. Chairman, we, we need to hold another hearing with Mr. Sandoval and ask him to, to show up. Um, so that, my, my time is up. I re, I re, I re. Well, I appreciate your remarks and your line of questioning, and I, I, I agree with you, Mr. Takano. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I recognize you for five minutes. Thank you. I think that person's uh, nomination is sitting over in the Senate now. <laughs> I think just for clarification, it hasn't been. I think they're queued up in a long line. Um, the, the question that I'd like answered uh, questions I'd like answered is, is how, how much money so far to date have we spent on an IT system that doesn't work, number one? It isn't working. We don't know it doesn't. We, it just hasn't been implemented yet. Number two, how much overtime have we spent, the taxpayers' dollars, because this IT system didn't come in on time? And uh, lastly, how much have we paid in overpayments to people that we're not going to claw back? And I think that's, I, I uh, will uh, think that's the right thing to do. I think you're doing absolutely the right thing there. It'd be very difficult to do. And one of the concerns I have with IT is I remember sitting here, I'm the only one that dies that was here at the time when the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of, of the VA, uh, Secretary Shinseki sat right there and spent a billion dollars trying to make the uh, Alton Vista systems talk to each other, and that's why we're doing Cerner now. So that is my frust one of my frustrations, that we've spent a billion dollars. I have no idea where it went. Um, and I don't want to see that happen again at the end of the day that we spent, I don't know how much money, I'm going to stop in a second and let you try to answer those questions. Um, it, it, we, we're going to be here a month or six months from now and find out that we've spent millions of dollars and we don't have a deliverable because I've seen that happen here. Um, so I'll stop in those three questions. Does anybody have an answer for those? And we're spending, uh, what the number I have is $380,000 a week in overtime. So the first two questions require us, we'll take for the record a comprehensive answer so that we're complete and not 
omitting anything? Do we have any idea, Dr. Lawrence, how much we've spent up until now? I mean, it's got to be some checks that have gone out. I mean, I know Booz Allen's not doing this because they like us. Right. So, so if, you don't, if you don't hold me to this with the ability, I can answer two okay. questions for okay. you, okay. which will be part of the answer we will give, which is a question of how much have we spent on booze, how much have we spent on overtime? Those two are subset not the complete answer to your first two questions. And the third one will give you an estimate, because as Mr. Worley points out, we actually will not know until we run the software who's been overpaid. But we'll give you an estimate on that one. So let's start with that. You can talk about how much. Yes, Chairman. Um, so far, we've paid to Booz for the Colmory Act um, parts of the contract, uh, $1.2 million. That does not include the um, software that Mr. Crow was talking about that has not been, you know, invoiced yet. So 1.2 million today, to date. Okay. So it's not a it's not a money issue. We the the funds are there to do what you need to do. Funds are there to do. What you Correct. Okay. Um, I, I appreciate that, and and I appreciate your candor in that. Um, and just for the record, um, and and maybe you want to answer this or not, but our committee was asked not. We were asked not to send a team to Muskogee. I th and the report I got back from Muskogee was those folks are working hard. And they were very, very, I mean, I got a, a glowing report to the people who were there trying to make this system work. And I can't imagine the frustration they must have when the system crashes over and over and they got to start all over again and go, I mean, I know how I am when I'm doing this and something, I want to throw it as far as I can. I can't imagine what, what they're going through out there and and have you all made a visit out there to talk to these three areas has someone made a trip out there and 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 shared what you're trying to do to help make their jobs a little easier uh, yes sir so we made a visit the next week after your team went out there we regularly talk to them don't forget the regional office director reports to a district director who reports to the office of field operation they hold regular communications around these issues Okay. I was the one who suggested your team not go because, again, the time your team spent with our people was time they were not processing uh, claims. Well, I, so I'm going I'm to interrupt it, you right there, and, and, I, and I will say this. As the chairman of this committee, I would not have learned anything sitting in that office right back there. So, I had to get out and travel all over this country and go firsthand to people and see what they're doing, put my eyeballs on the problem. I didn't. And I don't know, again, why you would have asked us not to go. We're trying to help make this better, not worse, and we can't do it unless we have accurate information. I didn't say not go. I said not go during our peak processing week when those people should have been processing claims. The five from your team and the two from the local senator were there for a day and a half. It took 15 of our members to, 15 of our team to provide information and do things with them. It was invaluable what they learned, no doubt. I didn't say don't go. I wish you would have waited a couple weeks so those people could have processed claims. That being said, the things you learned were valuable, and I want to be transparent on what my perspective was. I'm happy you went. Your team was glowing. That the, the, our team was glowing the next one. I thought the suspension. peak was back in August, not, not almost in November. The peak was in September and October, and that's what you were seeing being worked on. What was the date of that that we went out there? 24th of October. That was two weeks ago. That was at the end of the peak. That's right. We were processing 12,000 claims a day. Those 15 people, that's a non-trivial part of our workforce, sir. So again, what I was doing was articulating a veteran How many do you have totally in your workforce? 24,000, and the education workforce is about- We took 15, and that was enough to paralyze the whole operation? It didn't operation. say paralyze, sir. It had consequences. There were opportunity costs. You're always welcome. Every member of this committee and all their staff is welcome to come to all our facilities at any time they want. Okay, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, appreciate your engagement and, um, and being here with us today at this hearing. Uh, now, I want to recognize Mr. Cray again for another five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to be brief. Uh, just a um, follow-up question on uh, time that it takes to process claims. How long does it take to process a hardship claim? You said 28 days, uh, General Wilkes, for the regular claim. 
No, sir. Those are our, those are our targets. Uh, as okay. I mentioned, historically we do it much faster than that. The 28 days is for an original application okay. because it takes longer because we're verifying service information and those types of things. But once a, an individual is in school and the school sends in that certification, uh, in in 40 to 50 percent of those cases, uh, they go through our automation untouched by human hands, and the the checks go out within a matter of a, a handful of days. Uh, so uh, a hardship case, though to get to your question, uh, as we've solicited and gotten names from, uh, from this, st this staff and from VSOs and others, uh, we have a hardship queue, which is a protocol that we've had in place for a long, long time. It wasn't just instituted for this, where um, they get put into a hardship queue, and those hardship queues are cleared out um, virtually every day. So within three to five days or so after that uh, claim is processed, the individual has money in the bank. Thank you. Follow-up question, which is, I want to be part of the solution. There's a lot of challenges here. We're going to have to, this is a work in progress, so to speak. And can I work with your office so I can get the information out to my veterans? California is home to the largest number of veterans in the country. In my area in Orange County, we have plenty of young veterans coming back from servicing a country. I'd like to work with you to get the message out, your 1-800 number, whatever it is we need to do to make sure veterans are connected immediately to a solution should they find a problem. So. Uh, later on off, offline, we'll talk about how to get the message out through my office to our veterans. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I yield. Thank you, Mr. Correa. Um, if, if you guys would indulge me with one question, just a follow-up question, one or maybe one and a half, but it'll be real quick. Um, Mr. James, you're with the IT outfit, and Mr. Galvin, I think you're with the IT outfit. Have y'all been to Mus Muskegee? Muskegee? I'm from Texas. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, we have. We, we accompanied Dr. Lawrence. Okay. Okay. And, and um, um, Dr. Lawrence, let's conclude with this. Uh, and I want the folks who are watching and listening, and I want my colleagues to, to be clear about your answer to this. Do you have a sense of confidence that you are getting your arms around this and that uh, this issue will be resolved. Um, we won't yet put a time on it, but do you have confidence that this issue will be resolved in the near term? Yes, absolutely. And, and you have high confidence it will be? Yes. Okay, if you have the information, and I'm not trying to trap you or trick you, but if you have enough information that you have a high confidence it'll be solved, then you ought to have enough information to give us a time frame. You should. Now, listen, it'd be one thing if you're just, we're still digging into it. It's, it's, we don't know what we've got. You know, we're not sure yet. And we're still, listen, if you're confident, that confident, I, I believe you owe this committee and the veterans who we all serve um, a time frame. And um, so I'm going to ask that you submit that for the record. Um, like uh, we're going to need the responses to questions that were asked today, and we will follow up with it. But I, I, I think everybody up here feels like if you all feel like you're getting your arms around it, you feel like it's going to be resolved in, uh, in, the, in the near term, you ought to be able to give us um, uh, a time frame. So we're going to expect that, and, um, and you can go back and talk to the secretary and the CIO acting and come up with a time frame so that we can, we can continue to hold you accountable because that's our job. Can't really hold you accountable if you don't have that, uh, that date. Um, if you will also indulge me in just saying a few kind things about my colleague from Texas. Um, this is, I think, our last hearing, right? Um, and I think it's gonna be our last hearing for this uh, Congress. And I didn't have any prepared remarks. Uh, but I've got to say, one of the joys of my service, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the opportunity to serve as chairman over this committee. I sure hope we've pushed hard, fought hard, worked well with all to try to make a difference for our veterans in our country. I could not have done this without Beto O'Rourke. And um, so, uh, yeah, please.
One of the most gratifying experiences of serving in Congress has been serving on this committee and the subcommittee and working with Beto, and it's because we are red, white, and blue in here, and it's so refreshing. Um, and we do battle, and uh, we, we have wildly different views, I'm certain, on many issues. Um, but you wouldn't know it the way he treats me, and I hope the way I treat him. And uh, we need a whole lot more of that in this place. Uh, but you really set the tone because I'm just a freshman. And uh, you, you, you were such a great support. And, uh, and you have helped me lead in a way that we were all effective and productive for our main customer, the veteran. So there are not enough words to, to say thank you appropriately. But as a fellow Texan, I think you get the drift, right? Well, God bless you and your family. And thank you for your service to this country, Beto. And with that, I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material without objection. So ordered. Thank you very much. Amen. Super kind. Yeah. Very yeah. 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 my primary. Hey, what you said yeah. now. Yeah, I could see it. 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 Yeah, I could see it.